I suspect by this point the vast majority of people watching this video will already have seen a review or demonstration of this device because it's been on the market for three months now. This is the all-in-one three-axis stabilised gimbal and camera, the DJI Osmo Pocket. As someone who's interested in unusual small cameras, I pre-ordered one back in November and it arrived mid-December. One of the things that particularly attracted me to it was the fact it records in 4K at up to 60 frames a second. Now what I'd like to do in this video is give you a long-term owner's review, well a three-month one. It's March 2019 now, a lot has changed since it was first launched in December, but most of the reviews were done when it first came out, and now the camera is a lot better than it was back then. So let's go through what has changed, but first we'll go all the way back to December and what the camera was like when I first set it up. Now initially I was pretty impressed with the setup procedure, it seemed very slick. You attach the appropriate connector onto the Osmo Pocket, download the application to your phone, put those two things together, the application recognises the Osmo Pocket, you then have to create an account with DJI, it registers the device and it all seems very automated and then of course it downloads the latest firmware. All well and good except it made the device start up in the Chinese language mode. And for the life of it, I could not find a language change option. So I downloaded the full online manuals, but I could find no mention of language in there either. In the end, I had to resort to calling the helpline, the first time I've ever called a helpline about any product I bought. But they were helpful, they taught me through it. It was about three menus up, four to the right, press the thing at the bottom right, and there we go, we're in the right language. I had a feeling though that I wasn't the only person to ask them about this. They seemed very ready to give me the answer. I think there must have been a bit of a glitch in the first batch. Now I'm going to do something a little bit different in this video. I'm putting the section about the menus, the options, all to the end of the video. This is the part that most people find uninteresting and it goes on too long and it slows the video down. It took me 19 minutes to go through them for this particular camera so those are all going to be shown after the Patreon credits at the end. So if you want to watch 19 minutes of menus, by all means, hang around after that. But for most other people, I'm sure they just want to see how well the camera performs. So let's start off by having a look at some video that I took in December. The main positive to this camera is its compact size. You can just hold it in your hand in front of your body. The lens will stay horizontal if you want it to do that, and that means that you'll get a good shot of whatever you're walking past or through. It will keep a nice straight horizon. You don't have to worry about the positioning of your hand. But you'll notice there is quite a bit of bounce here as I'm walking along. I'm not really trying very hard to keep it steady. And look at this as it goes up towards the sky. It gets the exposure quite dark there. That is a bit of a problem. It also doesn't work particularly well in low light, I found. When I was shooting inside the house, it didn't look too good. But you notice the exposure on all of these photos is quite dark, quite a bit darker than I would have wanted it to be. But the sound quality is surprisingly good. <laughs> You might have spotted the camera hunting for focus on that last shot. It's an autofocus lens on this rather than just being a fixed focal length like most action cameras. But you might see it again here. It pulses in and out a little bit as I move towards the ground there. And every time I took that same shot, I got the same effect with it. Another thing I was a little bit disappointed with was the field of view. It's very narrow. You'll see it here. This is the camera held at arm's length. That's the maximum you can get in shot. One thing I did like was the slow motion, 120 frames per second in 1080p. And of course, with you holding the camera so steady, you get a really pleasing effect with that. The camera is also capable of creating these ultra wide panoramic photos. Now, back in December, when I shot these, it could only do one version of these. Another was added in a later firmware. I'll show you that later in the video. But this one was based upon four individual photos that the camera pans around and takes, and then it stitches those together in the application to create this very narrow and quite distorted image. Perhaps it's better off shooting landscapes with this, and you've got to be careful if anything moves across the frame because it will get repeated, and also the exposures based upon the first frame which it carries through the other photo. So you've got to be quite careful what you shoot. But later on, you'll see why it's perhaps best just to completely avoid this mode entirely. 
Now, getting your review out early is very important as far as views go. The camera came out in December. Everyone wanted to get the reviews out as soon as possible. I understand that. This video will get a fraction of those views. But if I did a review in December, it's going to be very different to my opinion now. Because back then I was very unimpressed. I was underwhelmed. I was a little bit fed up. I'd spent so much on something that just didn't seem to perform very well. But since then, there's been a couple of firmware updates that have really worked towards improving some of the issues that I was having. So now the March experience is considerably different to my December experience. And on top of that, since the camera came out, some of the accessories that were promised at launch have now also come out. And a couple of those are really very handy. So now I'll give you the March impression of this camera rather than the December one. These three accessories give the camera features that, in my opinion, it should really have had out of the box. For example, this one is the wireless adapter. Plug this into the bottom of the camera and it now has Wi-Fi and Bluetooth capabilities. So it communicates with the application on the phone exactly as though you plug the camera into the phone, but it's doing it wirelessly. Not absolutely essential, but very handy, especially useful if you plan on taking time lapse or longer video because you can plug the charger into the bottom of here as well while still communicating with the camera. Next up is the control wheel that slides into the accessory socket on the front. And since having this on the camera, I haven't wanted to shoot without it. It gives you this wheel on the left hand side, which you can use for controlling the vertical or horizontal motion of the camera. And it gives you two additional physical buttons. And I'll explain the function of those at the section at the end of the video, all about the controls. But you can see it also gives you a bit more of a camera to grip onto, doesn't obscure the screen or the microphone and enables you to pan the camera around or up and down using that wheel while still holding the screen perfectly straight in front of you. Now you remember my issue in Liverpool when I was trying to get a selfie with John Lennon and he didn't want to take part because the field of view was a little bit too narrow. Well, that's because I was doing it wrong. Apparently, if I look back at the video, the promotional video, all the selfie type shots on there were taken with the person holding the camera away from them on a selfie stick. Yes, I know it's a bit of a kludge and you can say, well, maybe they should have had a wider angle lens, but that is how they expect you to take self shots with a selfie stick. And you can only attach one of those to the camera if you have the appropriate adapter, because this camera doesn't have a tripod screw mount on it anyway, which was a bit of an oversight, I think. But with this in place, it's a cradle that goes around the camera and gives you the appropriate bracket on the back for attaching to any GoPro style mount. And as before, this cradle doesn't obscure the screen or the microphone below the screen, and you can still access the two buttons that are on the camera. But of course, you can't use this in conjunction with the control wheel. However, you could still plug the wireless module into the bottom of the camera whilst it was in this mount. So let's now take a look at some of the more recent video and photos that I've shot since getting those accessories. And these were taken, I believe, using firmware version 1.03. I'm now up to 1.04. So this isn't the latest firmware, but I can see a definite improvement in the way the camera handles exposure compared to how it did with the earlier firmware that I was using in December. There are still quite a few issues that you have to get around though. That narrow field of view is still very narrow for shooting anything that's close to you. You really have to keep your eye on the screen, which with an action camera, you wouldn't have to worry about that. You'd be able to just point it in the general direction of what you wanted to shoot and get it in shot. However, with this, you do have to keep looking back at that screen all the time just to check that what you thought you got in frame is still in frame. But I've got to say, with the thumb wheel attached to this, it really did give me a lot more control over the camera than I had earlier on. I was able to get the images that I wanted to as long as I just kept an eye on that screen all the time. And after using the camera for a few months, you start to get a feel for what it's good at and what it's not so good at. So indoors in low light, it looks pretty grainy, but it's not really the kind of environment you'd really need to stabilize very much. You're much better off using it outdoors in a nice sunny environment. You'll get some really good images. And if this was the only camera in your pocket, you could use it to capture some decent quality 12 megapixel stills. Although I'd imagine most people nowadays would be carrying around a modern smartphone, which would probably produce better results than this. Although a smartphone might not be able to capture one of these 
panoramic images. Now, this is based upon nine individual stills, three across the top, three in the middle, and three at the bottom, all stitched together in the application. We've still got the option to create those wide panoramic images, which are based upon four photos across the center, but this creates a squarer type of a image but I wouldn't recommend using it. I didn't realize at the time, I thought I'd be getting 12 megapixel stills all stitched together, but instead it creates an image of 2356 by 1690. So it's quite grainy and low res when you zoom in. Compare that to a single still at 12 megapixels, which is 4,000 by 3,000, and that's a lot sharper. So unless you really want that panoramic image, just stick to taking normal stills. I have to wonder why they chose such a narrow field of view for this lens. Because the way that this camera is designed, you feel that it's supposed to be used for selfies, for want of a better term. The microphone is on the same side as the screen and as the controls. So I'm talking towards the microphone now. If I was shooting the things in front of me, the microphone would be facing away from them. But I'm holding it at a comfortable distance. And as you can see, my head is rather large in the frame. I really have to hold it at maximum arm's length to get things framed as I would like, but that's quite uncomfortable. So with this narrow field of view, I'm just about staying in shot. The camera's doing face tracking on me, but you don't really get to see an awful lot of the background. What you're better off doing is putting the camera out on a selfie stick if uh, your pride doesn't stop you from doing that. So I've got a selfie stick with me now and I've got the mount to go on there and a selection of extensions and brackets to make it fit. So I'll just pop it on there now and we'll see what difference that makes. Right, so this is quite a bit better as far as seeing some of the background. Of course, it's a little bit shakier as well because I've got it on the end of this stick, which means that the effect of the background kind of moving around while I'm staying still or vice versa. It, uh, it's not a very pleasant image, but I can't really hold it much steadier than this. Of course, the downside of this as well is that I'm now quite a bit further away from the microphone. Now, they are going to be offering a uh, way to connect a, an external mic to this, so I could put a lavalier on or something, but uh, it connects to the USB-C port at the bottom. Apparently a few people have tried various other USB-C to microphone adapters and they haven't worked with this, so you'll have to wait for the official one to come out. I'm afraid we've got to cut in on that footage of an asthmatic man who's unable to breathe through his nose trying to talk to camera while walking along a canal towpath to bring you this information. The DJI USB-C to microphone adapter is now available to order, but just look at that price. Yes, it appears that DJI are taking a leaf out of Apple's book when it comes to pricing up their dongles. Okay, so what I've done now, I've attached the USB-C adapter to the bottom, the wireless adapter. So that's now transmitting the video live from the Osmo to my phone. I'm looking at my face now on the phone and I can see I'm in shot. However, if I move to one side, I notice it doesn't automatically track me. It seems like face tracking gets turned off when you plug in the wireless adapter. So to get it to track me now, I have to draw a square around my head and that initiates the object tracking. So now I can move off to one side, or move the stick at least, I'll stay in position, and it should be following me around. So now it's going to keep track of me as an object while I'm walking along. It's not looking at a face though, so unfortunately if I lose the tracking and then come back, it won't re-initialize because it's seen a face. It's looking for an object. So if I just move the camera quickly like that, Right, it's lost the tracking now, so as you can see, I'm out of shot. So even if I move into shot and say, hello, here I am, it's not going to follow me at all. It's quite happy just carrying on doing its own thing. So what I'd have to do now is sort of move it around to get myself in shot. I've got a uh, virtual joypad type thing on the screen here. So you'd have to move that around, get me in the middle of it, and then draw a square around my head. And there we go, we're back tracking again. So yeah, it's uh, probably better off not doing it this way. I don't know why I did it in the end. Oh yeah, that was it, so I could see myself on this screen. But yeah, I think you're better off just initiating the face tracking, which is the one that automatically happens when you don't have the wireless adapter attached to it. One other thing that I was eager to try out was to see how well the camera coped with being in its cradle attached to a GoPro mount 
and put on the handlebars of my motorcycle. I don't tend to mount cameras here because the handlebars have a lot of vibration going through them. And you can see the camera vibrating around here. Even though the mount is rock solid steady, the camera is shaking about because it's just getting the vibrations through the bike. How well would it cope with that? Would it be able to smooth those out? The answer is no, it looks absolutely awful. In fact, close your eyes if you're a bit susceptible to anything like this, but it really does look like I'm just about to travel back in time here. So I wouldn't recommend using it for that. In fact, I'm surprised I didn't manage to break it doing this. Looking at the promotional video, it appears that the chap who's using it on his motorcycle here has got it attached to his helmet, which is where I'd usually put a camera because that dampens down an awful lot of the vibration. Now, one of the big benefits of the Osmo Pocket is the fact that it will fit in a pocket, unlike most gimbals. But you don't just want to pop it in a pocket like this because these components at the top are quite delicate and are easily damaged. So you pop it in the carrying case. And once it's in here, you can even charge it without taking it out of the case because it's got a hole in the bottom for the USB-C lead. But I'd imagine most people wouldn't just carry this around on its own. There are some other things that you'd want to take along with you one of which would be the adapter to connect this up to your smartphone. Now this is the kind of thing that you could easily lose, so it's probably best keeping it attached to the camera. And whilst it's on the camera, you can still put the camera in that carrying case because there's a hole in the top here that that will pop through. Although I don't really like the idea of that. I kind of get the feeling that is going to get damaged or snapped off. But anyway, that's better than if you decide to attach the thumb wheel to the camera. Once that's on there, well then of course it won't fit in the case that comes with it. But that's not the only accessory that I've got. For example, if I was to go on holiday with this camera, I'd want to take all these things with me. And there isn't a case from the manufacturer that holds those. Fortunately though, there are third party manufacturers making cases for the Osmo Pocket. And this one didn't cost that much, so I bought one and it's very handy indeed. It holds almost everything that I want to take with me, including that little plastic cover, which I'd imagine most people are going to lose. That's got a slot there and there's even a slot here for another micro SD card. But I've still got a couple of things that I can't fit inside this case. And by buying this case, now the whole pocket concept of the Osmo Pocket has pretty much gone out of the window. One of the upcoming accessories that was featured in the promotional video was this charging case. But as you can see with this, there's no room in here for any accessories either. Talking about batteries and micro SD cards there, reminded me that I haven't really got into the specs of this camera in any great detail. So just a couple I'll pick out of here. The battery life in 1080p 30 is 140 minutes and it will take a micro SD card up to 256 gigabytes. I'm not quite sure what the battery life is in 4K, but I found it lasted me as long as I needed. There are definitely some odd decisions here. You plug one thing in and something else will stop working. It's almost like the teams working on these things didn't talk to one another. You plug the wireless adapter in and it means face tracking is deactivated. But I would have liked those things together. You put the thumb wheel on, it won't fit in the cradle anymore or in the carrying case. But the thumb wheel seems almost like an essential accessory to me. Once you've got hold of that, you'll realize why. It just uh, makes the camera so much more functional. The fact that you can adjust the up and down without having to just recenter it all the time. You can uh, produce shots where you're going from low to high or left to right, but one or the other, that's the weird thing about it. Why not have a little thumb pad on there so you could control it up, down, left and right without having to switch between them. There's just some weird decisions in here that I can't quite get to the bottom of why they've gone in that route. It's almost like they started with something. They thought, oh, hold on, we could do with a thumb wheel. Let's uh, make one of those. Oh, hold on, what about, why? we need a wireless thing. We'll make one of those as well. Everything's kind of separate. You wonder why it wasn't all incorporated in the device initially as one fully featured should product. But then again, maybe that would have made it too expensive. I'll tell you what, it's not cheap though. Once you buy it and then you start adding all these accessories to it and I've yet to get the USB-C um, lavalier adapter for this as well. So that's something else to buy in the future. When will this end? I wonder. 
Well, I can tell you it's not going to end just yet. There are some accessories that they've advertised that are still not yet available, including that charging case I mentioned, but ND filters, waterproof case, and an extension rod. Talking about that, that's what the lady was using in the promotional video. And in a still out of that, you can see that that extension rod has the controls down at the base, which is handy, but it also has what looks like a thumbstick. So proper four-way control, which is something that I really wish they'd have just put on the device in the first place. It's not like they didn't have room to fit it on there either. So in summing up, I'm a lot happier with the camera now than I was back in December. But to get to this stage, I've had to do a couple of firmware updates and buy some additional accessories. That's quite a bit of expense. I don't think the product was really ready for release when it came out. The manufacturers rushed it, perhaps, at the end, and that will have counted against them because they'll have got negative reviews back in December. People will have got frustrated with things it wasn't doing very well. And if they'd just waited, that wouldn't have happened. But you see this with so many products. One thing I will say, the narrow field of view is always going to be an issue. You have to keep your eye on that screen like a hawk to make sure that what you think is in frame is actually in frame. And it is a very small screen to keep your eye on. But overall, it's an interesting camera, but a very niche camera and one that's only really suitable for use in certain situations. If this video has interested you in the Osmo Pocket in any way, if you want to give me some affiliate revenue, there's links in the video description text box and that'll take you through to Amazon, but you could just buy it from the manufacturer's website and I wouldn't get a penny. Or oh, don't buy it at all, entirely up to you. And if you want to hang around after the credits, I think they take about two minutes to get through, you might want to skip forward, you'll get to see this whole 19 minute section going on and on and on about how the camera works. But that's it for the moment. As always, thanks for watching. Right, we'll start off by talking about the buttons on the device. Of course, there's just two. The one on the right is the power button, the one on the left is the shutter button, but of course it would be the start and stop button if you were recording video. So to turn it on, you hold down the button on the right. Now, depending upon what mode you've got the camera set up in, it will either orient the camera so that it's completely straight to the horizon, or it will orientate itself so that it's straight to how you've got the camera held. I'll show you which mode it starts up in in this one. So I'll hold down the button here. Now in this one, I'm gonna to have to hold the camera vertical. And you can see if I spin it round, the lens there is pointing straight at the horizon. Now, if I just switch it off again, and we turn it on at this angle, which is a kind of normal angle I might have it held at if I was looking down at it, you'll see that again, the camera is straight, but if I hold the camera straight now, it's pointing up to the sky. So when it's like that, you use the right hand button to 
straighten it out. So if we double tap the right hand button now, remember that was just the power button before, two taps and it will recenter it. So you see there, we've now got the room centered on it. So again, if I, uh, if I was to put it like that and I wanted it, well, you can't see the lens like that. So let's have a look, put it like that and recenter it. And now I can walk around looking at the screen, looking slightly down at it. But of course, if I put the camera straight, again, we're pointing straight up. I'll show you how to change the modes in a minute, but that's what the right hand button does. Oh, there's one more thing, three presses and it will spin around for your self shot. And of course, the left hand button in the particular mode I'm in, which is video, you can see at the top there, 4K 30. So I press that button, it will start recording and press it again, it will stop. Now, while you're recording video, there's a couple of things you can do by tapping on the screen. The first one, I think, is exposure. You just tap, you'll see a yellow box appear. Yeah, there we go. We can see the exposure changing. So if we just uh, tap on that white bit there, it goes darker. Tap down here. Should bring the brightness up a bit. And then the second thing we could do is you might be able to just make out this grey box. If I just put it over the corner there, just about where my thumb is. And that is the tilt control. So obviously you could tilt it by doing this, but if you want to keep looking at the screen straight on, but tilt the camera, you can touch this. Now here's where it becomes very tricky because you have to just get your thumb in exactly the right position. There we go, I've got it now. So we're tilting the camera up and down, but we're holding the camera itself or the body of it straight. It's the actual lens that's tilting rather than the whole thing. Of course, that means you can see the screen while you're tilting the camera. But that is where the thumb wheel comes in a lot more handy, a lot easier to use than the on-screen control. So those are two things you could do while the camera's recording. Let's stop it recording now and have a look at some of the other functions. So if you imagine there's a four-way arrow here with controls either side of the screen. So to get to them, you move the screen up, down, left or right. So we'll start off by going upwards and that brings us into this menu. Now this one is Resend, so which is the same as double tapping that. And then we can turn the camera around, which is the same as triple tapping this one on the right. So I'll triple tap it again to get it go back the other way. You see, after I've selected every one of these, the menu disappears. You don't have to click OK or anything. Now this one, we've got fast follow, slow follow, and oh, that's it. Fast follow and slow follow. And on the right hand side here, this is the control for the mode it will start in. So at the moment, we've got it on, let's start it off on follow. And follow means that it will, this is going to go out of focus, I know, but it will follow what you're doing. So I'm pointing it up now. You see the camera pointing up, pointing it down. It's pointing down, but it's, it's doing it slowly. It just um, does everything I want it to, but it just dampens down the movement. But if we change that mode now to tilt locked, you can see that the camera now, if we can get this flipping thing in focus, is staying level. And then the final thing off the bottom there is FPV. Now that is the mode that if you switch it on in that mode, which I'll just try and get out of this menu now, I'll turn it off. And now if we switch it on, even if we're pointing it at a weird angle like this and switch it on, the camera will point dead straight to its body. See like that? Whereas before it would have been pointing at the ground and I'd have to recenter it. So now my recenter control, which is a double tap, does nothing because the camera already wants to stay in that position. So obviously you've got to choose which of these modes you prefer. I tend to use follow. With that, you got movement, you can point it at things, but it just smooths everything out. But I suppose it's down to the individual at which mode you'd like. So that's the ones from the bottom. So let's move on to the other ones. I've got to apologize about this focus going in and out. So the, the easiest one here is playback. That's on the left. You can see we can play back the videos we've done and uh, you can go through them like that. And there might there'll be photos in here as well, but we can delete them, we can favorite them. Some of these menus you see go on for another step beyond where you've selected them to. So there's sort of pages of these things. Right, now if you want to change the mode and the settings for the mode, you drag in from the right. We're in the video mode at the moment. Photo at the top, 
next one down slow motion time lapse and panoramic now if we select panoramic we just drag across in there oops there's even more settings off each of these so we can choose a three by three or 180 degree panoramic so we'll choose three by three now to get out of any of these at any point you can just press that button on the right and it will take you back to where you started but you can see there at the top left hopefully three by three so i'll take one of those i just need to press the button on the left here hold the camera steady and it takes three across the top three across the middle and then three across the bottom now in the camera's menu if you try and get these off the memory card say and just have a look at them you've just got nine photos there it's not a panoramic photo until you put it into the app and export it if you look on the left here and try and view it it just says to put it into the app so let's just change it back into one of the other modes i'm not going to go through all the settings on here because this takes forever you can see there's just so much in here different slow-mo and video options i've been shooting in 4k 69 30 frames a second it could shoot at 60 frames a second though so it's quite powerful and 50 for those people that like to keep with the old uh, pal numbers and uh, over on the left here if i was to change it to 1080p 69 so yeah there's loads of different settings but i've been using 4k 69 30 frames a second now let's go into the final set of menus which is by pulling it down from the top and over here we've got oops i've ended up at the other one at the bottom you see this is well, this is the problem it's incredibly fiddly and it's uh, tricky to do this right there we go we're in the settings you see four settings there's one to the left what's that one don't even know what that one is uh super fine video is not available in the current video resolution okay so uh yeah i think if i went 1080p or something i better use super fine but i'm just using 4k so we go from there to the right now we can choose the screen as it appears full frame or widescreen i like to see what i'm shooting so we keep it widescreen and then this one is the brightness for the screen so i'm not going to mess with that but this one then if we click on that we've got further menus it tells you the battery and how long you want before it auto powers off and then there's more over here how much storage space we've got and then there's even more that's where you change the language and um I think there's something down there if I remember right. No, that's it. That's the full. It just goes on and on this thing. So yeah, there's 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 options galore, and you're controlling everything off this tiny screen, which is a little bigger than the Enema thumb and two buttons. So that's where the accessories come in because they do make it a little bit easier to operate some of these functions. Admittedly, you don't go in those menus all the time, but there are some of them that you do want to mess around with every now and then. For example, whether you want it first person video mode or whether you want to change the settings on the right here. So yeah, you need to get used to using this and it does take quite a bit of time. And even after you've had a lot of practice, you'll still find you qu keep pressing the wrong option. Right, let's bring in one of the accessories now. So we'll just slide off the accessory cover here. And of course, immediately lose that. And then slide on the control wheel, which should just pop into here there we go right so let's switch it on now and see what additional functionality that's given us there you go it says uh, control wheel connected i think so what we've got here on the left we've got a slider switch left and right and up and down so at the moment it's in the up and down position which means i've now got control up and down now that to me has proved very useful. I can hold the camera at this angle. I don't need to worry about how I've switched it on or what mode it's in. I can just move the camera up and down and get it pointing straight, even though I'm holding the camera at an angle. So that's uh, very handy. I tend to use it with this attached. And of course, if you switch that to the other side, then we've got left and right on here, which is actually quite a nice feature because you could get some nice effects like that just by standing still but getting the camera to spin around it does it a lot smoother than if you'd have tried doing it yourself like this but one or the other of course not both now i think the accessory that's going to be coming out with a selfie stick it says it's got a control stick on it so that sounds like that is more of the kind of up down left and right type option like a thumb pad 
don't know why they didn't do that on this. I would have much preferred this because this isn't a proper sort of wheel that rolls all the way around. It just goes up and down a little bit, just that much. That's, uh, that's the limits of its movement. So yeah, don't know why they chose a wheel rather than a control stick. I would have gone for the stick option, but then again, I'm not making a thing. Right, so we've got two buttons here now. So that's two additional buttons. We just had two before. So what do those do? Well, let's find out. Right, so the one on the right, well, that is now our flip option so we don't have to triple tap this one anymore to do that it's just a simple single button press that's kind of handy and then the one on the left well that is a little bit better because it changes the mode so now we've got tilt locked first person video and follow so we can swap between those three modes which previously were this at the bottom right here so it's replacing that button out of that screen and that button as well on these two buttons here. So I actually think this is a really handy accessory, this uh, wheel, and I kind of wish it had got this built in to start with. Right, let's add another accessory on here. Right, so for this next one, I'll need to unplug this. Luckily, these things are all hot swappable, so I don't have to switch the device off. And I've dropped it on the floor. Hold on. Now I've dropped the phone. So you see the uh, problem with doing this out in the field, that you're going to end up dropping all your stuff on the floor. And here's me sitting down while I'm doing it. But uh, anyway, plug in the smartphone adapter. And now find the phone that's on the floor. And wait for the camera to focus again. This is really problematic to shoot. Plug this into the phone, which I'm unlocking. I dreaded doing this, you know, because I really thought this is going to be a nightmare to shoot, and I'm absolutely right, it is. So I plug that into the bottom. This should automatically bring up the app. And there we go. Wow, it's a miracle. We've got something working. Okay, so you can see the screen's got off on the device itself, so now we're just using a smartphone screen. But it isn't just a large screen. There's more going on than this. We've got a control thumb pad here. Just bring that down and uh, somewhere over here just to make it central there we go and then on top of this we've got a load of additional controls i am not going to go into all this because whoops you can see it isn't the easiest thing to operate while looking through a camera viewfinder i'm trying to move it into the video mode uh, oh no I've gone too far that's slow motion that's video and then we've got the control we had before for spinning it around either way. And then we've got this story mode thing, which God knows what that's about. And then on top of that, I can also change the modes for the follow and the tilt that we had before, video resolutions down here. And from there, we've also got change the video format mov at the moment or mp4 oh, i didn't think you could change that cool go for the mp4 one then and then there's other things here for pro volume amplification level noise reduction. it just goes on and on this stuff i mean there's almost too many options here but uh, yeah if you were in this mode you do get the additional controls you can draw around things that you want to keep in focus at least I could when I was doing it before I'm sure I can let's have a look oh tracking unavailable in FPV mode so that means I have to change the mode here to follow there we go right so this is we're in follow mode again now I can draw around something so let's say I want to keep that jukebox in frame and there you go it's hooked onto it now so if I move the camera around well, we'll start recording video. Well, it's, it's following it, so it's not much use. This, this is a terrible demonstration because, as you can see, nothing's happening. The camera is keeping that object in focus, even though the camera's getting moved around, or in frame, I should say. Now, if I take that off, you can see we've got the camera moving again. So, yeah, th this setup is not how I'd use it because there's just too much going on here. You have to hold this. You've got your camera or your phone in this hand. They're held together by that little thing in the middle there. It, it just see it's a bit cumbersome. I didn't buy this to use it in conjunction with my phone. I know some people will, but 
I'm just not one of them. I bought it because it's a small item on its own. If I'm using the camera on the phone, I'm just going to use my phone camera. This is going to be its own thing. This is something that just slips in your pocket that you can use for these weird tracking shots, these gimbal shots. And I'll keep the camera on my phone as its own separate thing. Wow, that was, uh, how much of that was in focus? What, 10%? Maybe if we got that lucky. But yeah, honestly, this is, this is a tricky thing to shoot because I'm, I'm giving excuses here, but I'm looking through a camera viewfinder at a device that's so slim that this camera just wants to focus on the background all the time. And even though I've put it on a pinpoint focus, you can't use manual focus here because if I did, that'd be in focus, but then that wouldn't. And I need to keep moving it around. So, oh, this has just been one of those things that I really sort of got up this morning and thought, I'll shoot that sometime later on in the day. And it's now three o'clock and I finally got round to it after having a load of coffee. So yeah, not the easiest thing to demo. Sorry about that, but... You can see it's also quite problematic to shoot. What I'm going to do now, I'll go upstairs into the studio and... <laughs> studio, back bedroom. And what I'll do, I'll attach this thing to it. This is the out-of-focus, completely wireless adapter, which then gives this thing Wi-Fi powers. And that makes it a little bit easier to shoot some of this stuff. So let's go and do that now. So when you attach the wireless adapter to the camera, you gain all the features that you would have got if you'd have physically attached the camera to the bottom of your smartphone. One benefit to keeping both things separate is that the camera can now stand up. It doesn't sound like so much of a big deal, but if you attach the camera to your phone and hold it in landscape orientation, you're left holding the camera and the phone in both hands. You can't place it down while it's switched on because you risk damaging the mechanism. But with this, the camera can stand in the wireless base and you can access all those features separately on your phone using both hands. So creating a panoramic image is as simple as just tapping on one of the panoramas and it will stitch those together. This is one of the four image panoramas. You can have a look at it in more detail, but as we saw earlier on, these are pretty low detail, but from here you can save it and it will go into your normal photo library on your phone. And you can stream video from the device to your phone. And I haven't noticed any stuttering. It's very smooth. So again, this wireless adapter to me has proved to be very useful. And this is the way I prefer to use the camera and the phone combined. But it's important to note that all these features are available out of the box. You don't have to buy the wireless adapter. You just have to connect the camera up to your phone. But that's all I've got to say about the DJI Osmo Pocket. There's still things I haven't demonstrated, but I think we've been here plenty long enough. So this really is it for the moment. As always, thanks for watching.